Hi, take the title of this video, copy it, open your browser console, paste it in, and hit enter. You'll get this, the Srebrenica Triangle. In this video, I'll explain how the code generates the triangle, as well as a rough outline of how I got here, starting from a fairly normal implementation. Let's first analyze how the triangle is structured so we know exactly what we'll be implementing. You'll see that it's made up of rows, where the first row has one square, the second row has two squares, the third row has... Okay, you get the picture. Let's start with the first row, which is a square filled in. Then we go to the second row and calculate the first square in that row. Now here's the rule! Take a look at the square above and the square above and to the left. If and only if exactly one of these squares is filled in, the square we're calculating is also filled in. If the square is off the grid entirely, like this one, it's treated as if it's not filled in. Because of all this, we can conclude that this square should be filled in, because exactly one of these squares is filled in. Now if we go to the second square in this row, we see the exact same story there. Exactly one square out of the two is filled in, so we fill this one in. Now let's go to the third row. The first square is filled in, because only one of the above squares is filled in. The second square is not filled in, because both are filled in. The third square is filled in. If we repeat this process over and over again, creating row after row, we get the Srebrenica Triangle. Well, technically, the Srebrenica Triangle is the limiting case for this pattern if it were to be iterated infinitely, so this is just an approximation. Haha, <laughs> now you can't comment that to make fun of me. Alright, let's actually get to the code. We'll start simple and readable and progressively code golf from there. Let's start with the first row, which we'll simply represent with an array of booleans containing a single true value, called row. A true value corresponds to a filled-in square, false as an empty square. Then we'll loop 64 times to produce 64 rows of the Srebrenica Triangle. First, we actually have to display the row. We'll first create a row string, the string representing the ith row to be printed. Then for each square in the row, we'll append this filled-in character if the square is true or a space if the square is false. Then we'll finally print the row. Now we actually have to calculate the next row. First of all, we'll create an array for it. Then we'll loop over every square in the previous row, plus an additional square to take into account the fact that we have another square in the next row. We then get the square above and to the left of the current square, along with the square directly above. Then we check to see whether exactly one of them is filled. If this is the case, we add a true value to the next row. Otherwise, we add a false value. Finally, we set a row equal to the next row, so that when the loop loops around again, we can print it and find the row after that. If you're rightfully concerned about array out-of-bounds indexing, there is no need to fear. Indexing an array with an invalid index yields undefined, a value which is treated as false, thus fulfilling the condition that squares off the board are treated as if they were empty. Alright, now that we've got the easy-to-read implementation done, let's start golfing it. The first thing to realize is that we don't need these pesky trues and falses. We can simply represent them as ones and zeros, where true is one and false is zero. JavaScript coerces one to true if it's used in a logical operator or if statement. Similarly, it coerces zero to false. Consequently, we can leave everything else as is. Those of you who have studied logic might see another opportunity for improvement here. As I've stated many times before, we want to see whether exactly one of the two above squares is filled. Here's a truth table for that operation. Look familiar? This is just an exclusive OR or XOR operation in disguise. Therefore, since we're working with 0 and 1, we can just replace all these logical operators with a bitwise XOR, which also works for undefined. Now let's focus on the part that prints the string. This is fairly inefficient in terms of space, as you may be able to tell. The first thing we should do is eliminate this big bulky if-else statement by replacing it with a ternary operator. The next thing we can do is eliminate this annoying for loop by mapping over the booleans instead. If you don't know what map does, it runs a function for every element in an array and then creates a new array containing all those elements. Of course, this does present a bit of an issue, since when we go to print it, we get an array, which doesn't display nicely. To fix this, we can join all of them together with the join function, which concatenates an array of strings together. To get rid of those commas, we can then use the empty string as the separator argument. Now look at how much we've condensed this section. Here's where we are at now compared to what we had before. However, if the title of this video is anything to go by, you can probably tell that we're just getting started. To go further, let's consider what data we're dealing with. Each row is represented as a list of zeros and ones, where a one is filled and a zero is empty. We get the next row by XORing each list element with a list element to the left of it. Now, what other kind of data is represented as a list of ones and zeros on a computer? Numbers. What if, instead of representing each row as an array of ones and zeros, we represent each row as a number, which is itself under the hood just an array of ones and zeros? But wait, don't numbers have a limited precision? JavaScript uses IEEE 754 double precision floating point numbers, aka doubles but saying that way makes me sound smarter, which can represent integers up to 2 to the 53 without skipping any of them. This might seem like a deal breaker. However, recently JavaScript has added another data type, big ints. These are arbitrary precision integers, meaning you can make them as big as you want. This negates the issue of precision entirely. No more row array. Now it's a big int. Big ints can be instantiated by writing an integer followed by the letter n. We'll start at equal to 1, because 1 is, well, also 1 in binary, and we want the first row to just have a single active square. Let's skip over printing these numbers to the console for now and figure out how to calculate the next row. What we need to do is take every bit in the current row, 
XOR each bit with the bit 1 spawn to the left, and use that as our next row. Fortunately, bitwise operators allow us to do exactly that. We set the next row equal to the current row XORed with itself shifted one bit to the left. We then set row equal to next row. This saves us a ton of space because we no longer need the for loop. This is because the bitwise operators operate on every single bit of the big end at once. You can probably already see some more optimizations to make here. First of all, we can get rid of this unnecessary assignment since all of these calculations occur in a single step. Next, we can replace the left shift with the multiplication by 2 since both operations are the same thing. Now let's do all the console logging. Here's what we currently have. This, of course, won't work because the row is no longer an array. It's a big int. We somehow have to convert it to binary and then find a way to display that to the screen with the characters we want. We can do it by calling the toString method with 2 as the first argument, since we want it to be in base 2. The ones and zeros in the binary representation of the integer are analogous to the ones and zeros we had of the array before. At this point, if we printed the triangle, we get a bunch of ones and zeros. Since we want these different characters, we use the replace all function to replace all ones with boxes and replace all zeros with spaces. At this point, here's what we have as a whole. Let's get the printing operation more optimized. First things first, let's condense this into a single line. Next, we can save space by switching these calls to replace all with calls to replace, which saves three characters. The replace function only replaces the first instance it finds by default, which we don't want. We want to replace all the instances. We can get around this by changing these replacement strings to regular expression literals with the G flag enabled. This flag causes all instances to be replaced. It also adds an extra character compared to the string literal, but this is still a net savings of two characters per call to replace, saving us four characters in total. We can do even better, however. The word replace has a lot of characters we can do without. What if we only used a single replace operation? Believe it or not, this is something we can do. First of all, let's have the replace function match every character individually using the catch-all dot regular expression. Next, instead of giving a string as the second argument to replace, we supply a function. This function is given the matched string as input and returns the string that will replace it. So we'll just check to see whether the matched string is a 1. If it's a 1, we return a box. Otherwise, we return a space. Of course, we use a ternary for this to save space. We can do a lot better than this, however. Let's get rid of these quotes around the 1. Even though s is a string and 1 is a number, two different data types, we can still compare them and they will be treated as equal. This is known as type coercion since we're coercing the string to become a number. But wait, if we can coerce strings into numbers, and the strings we're working with are 0 and 1, we can use them as array indices. Instead of this ternary nonsense, let's use a lookup table. We have an array containing a space of the 0th index and a box of the 1th index. We then index this array based on the supplied character. Either way, this character will be coerced to a number, either 0 or 1. Then if it's a 0, the indexing operation will retrieve the space. If it's a 1, the indexing operation will retrieve the box. Okay, okay, but why do we have to use an array? Can't we index something else? Turns out we can index something else. Strings! This saves us two quotes, a comma, and some brackets, giving us this. Extracting the zeroth character yields us a space, while extracting the oneth character yields us a box. You get the picture. Now here's what we have as a whole. Of course, we can do better. Let's start by changing the variable names to one letter. This will start to become important for character count. We'll also remove the comments. Our next target is now the for loop itself. What if we didn't have to use this stupid indexing variable? Well, it turns out we don't have to. We can instead base the looping on the value of our row variable. We seem to be wanting to render roughly 64 rows, so let's just make sure it's less than 2 to the power of 63, since the 64-digit binary number is roughly that large. Of course, you might be wondering why it's not 2 to the 64 or 2 to the 65. The answer is that I have no idea, because I found this value by tweaking it until I successfully dealt with the off by one error. It's just guesswork. Anyway, now that we've done this, we can save a few semicolons by moving these two statements into the for loop. Okay, okay, we're almost done. Now that we have a single letter variable name, adding r to itself actually becomes more efficient than multiplying by 2, giving us this. We also don't need the parentheses, since addition has a higher precedence than bitwise xor. Well, so does multiplication, but I didn't want to go back through all the code I wrote for this script and remove the parentheses. The next change we can make is by removing the let. JavaScript straight up just doesn't care that you aren't properly declaring the variable, because it's, you know, JavaScript. Next, we can get rid of these curly brackets, since this loop only contains a single statement, and we can get rid of the semicolon, since of course that's optional since it is JavaScript after all. Now let's get rid of the white space, starting with the line break and then the spaces. Of course, don't forget to keep the space inside the string. We need that one. Okay, now there's one final optimization, at least the final one that I thought of. Can you spot it? Alright, here it is. You know how you can turn stuff like a equals a plus 5 into a plus equals 5? Well, it turns out you can do the exact same kind of thing with the bitwise XOR operator as well, giving us this. And that is the code golf Serpinski triangle implementation. Compare it to the original and get an idea of how much smaller it is. It's interesting also to consider where exactly its space comes from. The funniest part to me is that most of the code doesn't even generate the fractal. It just formats and displays it. The part that makes the actual Serpinski triangle calculation, on the other hand, is this. It's crazy to think that the process to create a shape as seemingly complex and intricate as this can be described in six characters. 
Of course, this doesn't take into account the process of seeding it or iterating it, which is covered by the rest of this for loop. But to me, at least, it's still kind of mind-blowing. Anyway, that's the end of this video. Let me know in the comments if you have any ideas for how to make this code even smaller. Have a nice day, and happy code golfing.